As we learned last week, the goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus as a close, personal friend. Let me read that again. The goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus as a close, personal friend. And the outcome of that friendship is a life that is permeated by peace. It is filled to overflowing with peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And you can't get to know the Prince of Peace as a close personal friend without having that peace rub all over you. We all have friends that when we get around them, their attributes, their influence causes us to be different. When you get around Jesus, who is permeated, he emanates peace. You can't help but have that flow out of your life as well. We read Galatians 5.22, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And as those who have trusted in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and this is what He grows in us, that sense of peace. But many things in life work against maintaining this mindset that rests in the peace of God. It may seem counterintuitive, but we need to work hard at times to remain in the peace of God. This hard work centers on solidifying that the truth of God's word is what we live by on a daily basis. No matter what else we face in life, no matter what tries to come against us, that we live by the truth of the word of God. As I said last week, we learned that there's nothing greater than knowing Jesus Christ and that to pursue a close personal relationship with him is by far the greatest thing in this life. In order to do this, there are a few basic things of Christian living that Paul reminds us this morning in the fourth chapter of Philippians that we need to stand firm on. If we forget about these things, our peace in the Lord will be snatched away from us. And instead of pursuing the Lord, we will be distracted by other less important pursuits. And so chapter four, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to that. We're going to take a look at three areas that easily, so easily distract us from that pursuit of a relationship with Christ. Disagreements, anxiety, and complaining. Verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, Paul writes, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. First area is disagreements. Disagreements are a fact of life and we should expect them in the church. We should expect to have disagreements with each other in our church family. It is not reasonable to think that we are going to agree on everything. So it is crucial to a healthy church family environment to have a way to work through disagreements. Not everything that looks like it will cause disagreements actually does. In fact, it's often the small things, the insignificant areas of disagreement, which cause the most trouble, the greatest problems. Now, Yodia and Syntyche are a great example of this because they work side by side together with Paul in the gospel ministry. That's the main thing. That's the big thing. And yet you can see that Paul is entreating them to agree together. Why is he asking them to agree? Because they're disagreeing. So he says, I entreat you guys to agree together. How does he ask them to do it? In the Lord. So he's not asking them to have complete agreement on everything that they think or they act or they believe. He is asking them to specifically agree together in the Lord. And we're going to take a look at what exactly that means. Now to highlight the lack of importance and sometimes what our disagreements are, you'll notice that Paul doesn't even mention what it is. Ask yourself why Paul didn't mention what the disagreement was. Because it was not important. It was insignificant. They needed to agree together in the Lord. So how do we do that? Some things are non-negotiable. In our relationship with Christ, in our Christian living, some things are non-negotiable. No, negotiable. Hebrews 6 highlights a few of these, what uh, it calls elementary teachings, verses 1 and 2. 
uh, where uh, these are the words. The foundation of repentance from dead works, that's one. Faith towards God. Doctrine, doctrine of baptisms. We're going to have a baptism in a couple weeks. Laying on of hands, which is when we set people aside for ministry. That's the laying on of hands. Resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. These things are non-negotiable. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This not of your own doing is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Thank you, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, for emphasizing that fact. We know that Jesus Christ is the only way to know God, and he told his disciples, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These things are non-negotiable. If you were to follow Christ, these truths must be agreed upon. Now, some points in belief Christians will disagree about. Paul addresses one of these particular areas that was of great concern for the Jews of his time concerning the laws of clean and unclean food. Romans 14, 14, Paul says this, I know and am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. You notice in Paul's words, that there is an open door for disagreements about belief in his comments. Now, in Mark 7, 19, we read that Jesus declared all foods clean. But for some of the Jews at the time, they had not yet come to this conclusion. They disagreed with Paul and believed that the food laws were in effect. But Paul basically says here, let's agree to disagree. There needs to be some tolerance for a difference of belief in things that are not essential to knowing Christ. In our church family, in the church of the world at large, there has to be some tolerance for disagreements on matters that are not essential. Now, how do we disagree? So let's practice on how we disagree. That's very important. We should stop, first of all, passing judgment on each other. Because when we pass judgment on each other, we are actually putting ourselves in the place of God and passing judgment on Him. We are, in, 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 in essence, saying, God doesn't know what He's doing because He hasn't told my brother or sister that what they're doing is wrong or what they believe is wrong. When we have that attitude towards our brother and sister in Christ, it is not them that we're passing judgment on. It is on God Himself. Who are we to tell God what he should and shouldn't do? If he is so concerned about my brother and sister's faith, then he has perfect ability. We say he's all-powerful. He can let them know. He has no problem in talking. He created communication. He has no barriers in communicating to people. But you see, we think he does. We think that God should Tell our brother and sister exactly the truth that we have come to believe. How dare God? How dare he not tell the truth to this person? I mean, come in, you know that's true, right? You understand that what I'm saying is not just funny, that you know that in your heart, that sometimes that's what you think. But we all have to take a step forward and learn how to disagree with each other. And there's a reason, I'm going to get to it, see if you can hear what the reason is. Sometimes our disagreements need to be addressed by limiting our freedom to do whatever we want to do. Sometimes we have a disagreement and the, the action step that God wants us to take is not to exercise the freedom that we know and have in Christ because our brother or sister doesn't have that freedom. And when we're around them and we exercise that freedom, it actually hurts their faith. And so Paul says this in Romans chapter 14, 20 and 21, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Now, the goal of this command of Paul is really to show concern and care. It is to show that there's great love for a brother and sister of Christ that reaches beyond our disagreements. Love is greater than what we disagree upon. Can we say amen to that? Our love is more important than to make sure that we are 100% accurate in everything that we believe and everything that we do. And so Paul says, if your actions 
destroy what God is doing in somebody else, you need to rethink what your actions are and maybe step, take a step back. If the greatest is love, and it is, then love should be the driving force in how we di address disagreements. So then, whatever the disagreement is that we have, we should agree together in the Lord. And there's one helpful form formula that people have used throughout the years that um, has actually been adopted as a motto by the Moravian Church of North America and also by the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And this is what it says. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now, charity is another word for love. Now, this is often attributed to uh, theologians like Augustine, but uh, Mark Ross of Ligonier Ministries says that it comes from a German theologian of the early early 17th century. And just because this name is awesome, I'm going to share it with you. Rupertus Meldenius. Now, if you can remember that and talk, sh share it with me, I'll give you some chocolate after church. No lie. I got some in my office in a secret stash. The phrase occurs on a tract of Christian unity written during the Thirty Years' War around 1627, one of the bloodiest times that Europe has ever seen. Religious tensions played a significant role. And so if we think that we have religious tensions in our world in America today, it's not new. Christians of all seasons and all times have learned, have had to learn how to love each other in the midst of tremendous disagreements. Again, this means that we agree on the essentials and we have freedom. We allow freedom on the non-essentials. This is where we learn to grow in the love of Christ. It may even be the reason why the Lord does not bring us into complete agreement on all non-essentials is because he has a greater goal and that goal is to teach us how to love each other. I think that's a great thing. I like to love people. I'd like to love people more. And guess what? The Lord, he knows how you tick. He knows how to push our buttons and he knows what's going to take for us to be able to grow in that grace and in that love. Moving on, Philippians 4, 4 through 7, Paul writes this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone because the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety. Anxiety is a stumbling block to the peace of God. We live in an anxious world. There is much doubt about the foundations of our society, which have been in place for hundreds of years. There is fear for the future, both for our country and our world. There's anxiety over any number of issues. There is anxiety for the younger generations over talking on the phone. There is anxiety over getting out of bed. There's anxiety over any issues. It seems like our world has had a dump load of anxiety that's been put on us. And it comes from all different directions. But the people of God rather than living in anxiety, have a promise, have a future, have a destination to look at things differently. Rather than responding in fear, the Lord calls us to respond by rejoicing in the Lord and to be reasonable. It's hard to believe that being reasonable in our world sticks out. It's hard to believe that. But if you're reasonable, you're not going with the crowd. Now, sometimes Christians get accused of not dealing with reality. Have you heard the phrase, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good? That's right. Now, that might be a person's response when Paul says rejoice in the Lord because someone might say, how can you rejoice in the Lord? What about all the things in our world that are wrong and need fixing? How can a person rejoice with all of the multitudes of problems that they face. It's just not reality to rejoice in the Lord. Well, the Lord teaches us through his word that we can rejoice at all times, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Now, it's even when the world around us is falling apart. We rejoice because, as Paul says, that the Lord is at hand. 
This is not a denial of reality, but is rather an acknowledgement of God's reality that He is omnipresent, that He is everywhere. It's not a denial of reality to rejoice in the Lord in the midst of terrible circumstances when you recognize that God is in and through everything. He permeates life. It is just an acknowledgement that there is a greater reality than simply the difficulties and the problems and trials and tribulations that we see. The power of anxiety is greatest when we only look at ourselves or the problems that we face and do not look at the Lord. But peace begins when we bring our problems to the Lord and and we place our trust in Him in everything. Now here's the process. Walk you through as Paul walks through in chapter 4 here. We face things that cause us to become anxious. We recognize them. In prayer, we bring them to the Lord. The next step is very important. We begin to thank God for answering our prayers even before we see the answers to prayer. Now, this is a foundational truth that as Christians we need to walk into. We need to be people that are thanking God in all circumstances even before we see the change that we are asking Him for. Why is that possible? It is possible because we know who God is, we know He loves us, and we know that He is working all things together for good. These are truths that we must live by rather than watch and respond to the things that are around us. We must understand these things and we must, in faith, this is a step of faith, thank you God for answering my prayer even before I see the answer. To be thankful to God is a response of faith. Many people, especially when facing fears and anxiety, they don't think they have much faith. Now, you might be in that category. Pastor Nate, my faith is pretty weak. I don't have a whole lot of faith. Well, good news for you. You don't need a whole lot of faith. You need a whole little faith. Jesus said mustard size. That's the smallest you can get. You just need a little faith. Now, let me break this down for you. Hebrews eleven six is good news for you because this is what it says. Whoever would draw near to God must believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let me ask you two questions. Do you believe that God exists? Do you believe that he rewards those who seek him? Then you have all the faith you need. You don't need any more faith. That's all you need to start to come close to God. You don't need any more. If you have that much faith, then you're good. You might even be able to say, thank you, Jesus. I'm good. If you need to say that out loud, you can do that. Yes, thank you, God, I'm good. All right, okay, so I was hoping, I was really hoping. Even Pastor Don wasn't in there on the amen on that, but that's all right. He's, he's going to get me later on in the message here. I'm having way too much fun. Let me move on. When we keep our eyes on him and we're pursuing knowing him, just trusting in him, he's going to then work things out. He will bring what he promises, the peace that passes understanding. Now, here's the thing. I memorized this verse uh, about the peace that passes understanding many, many years ago, and I can't tell you how many times that I have said this verse. If you don't have this verse memorized, let me make that an action step for you because you need that verse. I will, I will declare that verse. I will, I will stand on that verse. If you have not yet memorized, you need to do that because what happens is that when you bring your request to God, the peace of God that passes understanding, it will overcome you. It will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I have seen this happen time and time again. If you're anxious, you bring your request to God, you begin to thank Him, and what happens? The peace of God comes in. It is a supernatural work of God. You cannot explain it logically with your brain. You cannot do it, but you can by the Word of God. Instead of fear, the presence of God brings peace. Now, think about Peter. Peter was a guy who entered into a situation where he was very anxious. He asked Jesus to uh, let him walk out on the water. Now, I mean, the water. So, it's a storm, and the water's going up and down. So, can you imagine? He's walking on the water, And then he takes his eyes off Jesus and he starts to sink, right? This is the issue that we all face. We're in the midst of a storm. We're in the midst of difficulties and trials. We take our eyes off the Lord. We immediately begin to sink. Now, was the storm going before 
Peter started to sink. Was there any change in the storm after he took his eyes off Jesus? None whatsoever. The storm was the same. What was different? It was Peter and where he was looking. This is exactly the application that we need. If you're going through a storm, and chances are, you, if you're not going through now, you've come out of a storm or you may go into a storm at some point. If you're in a storm, this is the word that you need to be able to hold on to. Now, I'm not saying that this is easy to do. In fact, it takes a, a tremendous amount of work when you're in the grip of anxiety to keep your eyes on the Lord. It's not an easy path, but it is the right path. And just like Peter, we need those who will pick us up when we start to fall. He cried out to the Lord. The Lord held, held out his hand, picked him up, and brought him back to safety. This again, now this is the third week in the row that I'm mentioning it, this. This is the reason why we need to be in regular Bible study and groups that will encourage us in the Lord. It is in the context of sharing life together in the Lord that we can get our eyes off the storm and onto the Lord because every single one of us are going to go through times where we need help and we cannot do it on our own. And if we are not in regular, regular fellowship with each other, studying the Word, encouraging each other, lifting each other up, praying for each other, we will fall. It will happen. And so we need to respond to this and understand that God is telling us we need to be around those who will know enough of our life and what we're going through that they will be able to, when we're falling, reach down, pick us up. Brother, sister in Christ, we're walking this together. And we can hand, hand in hand move on to know the Lord and to uh, have victory in the midst of the storm. Maybe you, you've been diligent in resetting your mind on the truth of scripture from but from day to day you feel feel like you sink into the pit of anxiety what you need is your mind to be guarded from the attacks of anxiety and fear you need your heart to be protected by god's peace let me encourage you that these steps that paul shows for us in philippians chapter 4 are the steps that we need to take let me encourage you to stick with the program that paul lays out in scripture remember that you are in the lord's hands and he will bring you through. Last point for this morning, Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Paul writes this, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you third aspect that we need to understand that that uh, stands in the way of living in the peace of God is complaining now in our world today we have had a meltdown into a black hole into the black hole of complaining and Christians are not exempt from this it has become the default conversation piece especially if we don't know somebody very well we can always complain because we always know that we have a friend when we can complain it, it isn't this a true statement if we complain about something, we have some affinity, and so we can have a connection with somebody. Instead of doing everything without complaining or arguing, as we're instructed by Paul in Philippians 2.14, complaining has reached a level of artistic perfection. We are really good at this. I dream of a world where us as Christians, we'd be really bad at this. Really bad at complaining. Paul gives us an instruction manual on how to get there. If we don't recognize that living in this way, like the rest of the world, and how, how complaining is pervasive, if we don't recognize that that is the method by which our peace is snatched away from us, then we will continue to live as those who are under the weight of anxiety. The peace of God comes from living according to how God calls us to live. Now, the formula here is likewise very simple although it may be difficult to master because it requires a mindset reset. We must begin to think about things that are worthy of praise. We must train our brains to resist the slide into sewage and instead reach toward the heights of God's way of thinking. Now, we all need to vent. We all need a, a time where it's healthy to share frustrations, but it's not healthy to live there. When our default is to think about things that we complain about, then something is not working right. Now, sometimes it's just a matter of thinking about 
what we say and to determining to spend more of our time during the day to think on things that are excellent or worthy of praise. A potential goal is to spend 80% of our time thinking about whatever is commendable and 20% of our time on what is stinky. It may take a long time to reach that goal. Start by simply tracking your conversations and work towards sharing one topic that is not wrapped up in complaining. Sometimes our complaining should let us know that we need to be healed from something that's painful in our past, which is bogging us down in the present. If we can't seem to work through venting and get to praising, you know what I mean by that? We don't get out of the venting, we stay in the complaining, we can't get to praising, then something may be wrong where we need God to free us from the pain and the difficulties and the things of, the, of our past. Now, when something happens in your day that triggers an especially difficult experience from your past, and at that moment you're transported into the past, and it's almost like you re are reliving that situation in the present, let me tell you, you have an opportunity to seek the Lord for freedom. Now, the Lord has given us tools as His church to be able to help people out of the difficulties of their past and into freedom in the future. If this is something that really hits with you, I would invite you to come and just talk to me because God has given us the ability to be able to address the things in our past which are holding us down and keeping us from a life of freedom and peace for our future. It's God's will for us to be set free, set free from the things that keep us from knowing Him more and living in the light of His presence and, as Paul says today, His peace. Now, in my Bible, I have a piece of paper that outlines my seven-step devotional method, and I do this on a daily basis. I know what my devotional method is. I developed it myself. But at that moment in the morning when I have the time to set aside to the Lord, sometimes my brain doesn't engage. You know what I'm talking about? And I actually forget, what do I do next? And, you know, it's the kind of like, as human beings, sometimes we just forget about things. So I have it in my Bible, and I just open to it, and I pull it out, and I, I read it, and I say, okay, next is meditation. Let me meditate on your word. I do that because I know who I am as a human being, and I know that I forget things. Now, one of the things that is true is that we forget what we already know so easily on a day-to-day -day basis. We just get off track. And in the moment, the things that afflict us throw us off from our peace in the Lord. Unless we put something into practice, then all of our good intentions go out the window. So I'm going to encourage you along the lines of James 1.22. James says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We have to learn the Word of God and live it out. So let me offer a simple way to put this scripture of thinking on these things into practice. I want to invite you to do this. Take part of your devotion time in the next two days, tomorrow or the next day, and write down five things that are true and think about them during your time of devotion. Just think about them. We call this meditation. Look at them from every possible angle in your mind. Write down five things that are honorable. Write down five things that are just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. During your time with the Lord, look at what you've written, and then be think about it, and then move on to thanking God for these things. You don't have to do them all the time. Just do maybe once a day. Paul says... Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are true, whatever things are just, honorable, praiseworthy, excellent, think about these things. Let me ask you a question. How are you going to move from the things that you're thinking about that are complaining oriented to the things that are excellent and praiseworthy oriented? How are you going to make that transition? One of the ways is you could write down those things. Write them down and begin to think about them. There's an opportunity for you to Make the bridge to be able to think about these things. As we do that, the peace of God is going to permeate our lives. Now, this is the place where the rubber hits the road, where we partner with the Lord to reset our mindset. As we begin to think about things that are worthy of praise, our minds begin to be reset on who God is and what He has done. 
Now this summer, when I was out in California for the Seventh-day Baptist annual conference, my computer died. There was no hope for resurrection. There was no afterlife. It was the blue screen of death. So Neil Lubke, the IT dude, he set me up with a new computer. And every time I log into my new computer, it now displays a picture of some part of the world that I've never seen before. Now these pictures are of the most beautiful locations that I have ever seen. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you have a new computer that does it for you. The end result is when I look at these places that are absolutely gorgeous, I begin to have my mind focused on the God who created those things. And why did He create them? He created them for us. And I begin to praise God and my mind simply by looking at things that are beautiful and excellent and worthy of praise, my mind shifts. And so my day is brighter. I don't know who at Microsoft or Bing or whoever did that had that in mind, but the effect of it is powerful. When our minds are reset on the beauty and the glory of the Lord, it's then that the peace of God powerfully guards our hearts and our minds from the anxiety and the moral pollution that we face each and every day. Now we've talked about disagreements, anxiety, and complaining. These threaten to take away the peace of God, which are God's gift to us as his children. Let's not allow these to get a foothold and tear us down. Let us learn to be those who live in the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's put this into practice. Let's pray for me. Father, I give you thanks and praise for your word, which teaches us how to live. It, Lord, helps us to know you more, helps us to understand how you've created us, how you've made us, Lord, to be those that live in the peace of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage, that you would give us the ability to put these things into practice so that we can experience the peace. Father, for those who are bogged down with anxiety, for those who are bogged down in fear, for those who have these obstacles in front of them, I pray, Lord, that you would provide the power that only you have to be able to move these obstacles out of the way so that, Lord, they can walk into the peace of God. We give you the praise, Lord, uh, for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.